Tennessee Life is sponsored by Next to New, an upscale consignment shop serving Knoxville. Next to New Knox.com. And by The Flower Pot for over 100 years, offering flowers and same day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations knoxvilleflowerpot.com and by viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up on Tennessee Life, we explore and rediscover our Celtic roots with a homegrown writer who shows us the great connection between the people of the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee and the Emerald Isle. There's something about us as human beings. We want to know who we are, where we came from, what what makes us different, what makes us special. A love for bluegrass naturally evolved into a love for traditional Irish tunes for this musician. So much so, now he makes one of the instruments. When creating something like that from scratch, it's really, it's a very powerful experience and I have a really deep connection with every instrument that I build. And a view of covering news in Tennessee, literally through Irish eyes. An Irish journalist is enjoying his Chattanooga welcome. Those stories next on Tennessee Life. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Tennessee Life. I'm your host, Vicki Lawson. Many of the words and expressions we say, we assume they are purely Tennessean or Southern, but many aspects of our state's culture actually have deep Celtic roots from our speech to our colleges and names of counties. Stephanie Aldridge interviews Tennessean author, Dr. Barry Van about his book, Rediscovering the South Celtic Heritage and why Tennessee felt like home for the Celtic people. Dr. Van, thank you so much for joining us. First, could you tell us a little bit about your Tennessee roots? Where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Clinton, Tennessee. We were pretty poor when I was a child. And so like a lot of poor kids, we. Uh, followed our families up north uh, where we went to Detroit. I learned how to say walk, talking on to go along with walk, talking on. And my family basically were construction workers and my grandparents raised me and so uh, when they retired I was around 12 years old. We moved back to Tennessee and, and I went from not knowing anything about a rototiller to having to plow up the yard and plant potatoes and hoe stuff. And, it was, a, it was a pretty humble experience, really. When did you start getting really interested in more about your background? Who am I? Who well, was here before me? You talked about your grandparents mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. mountains, but yeah. there's some other connections there that go further back. Yeah, they do. Uh, you know, I was uh, unfortunate in some respects. I was born out of wedlock, and so I didn't know my biological father until I was about 14, and I, I had to look him up on my own. At the age of 20, I took his last name. And so growing up, I was Barry Walker. And so after my dad and I developed a relationship, I did change it to, to Van. My father's family um, claimed to be uh, of Scottish origin. And there happens to be a place in North Georgia called the Van House. It's a, it's a historic site. It's a state historic site. And, and that's where our family, my father's line, claims descent from. So I started reconstructing ideas about our belief system, about our ideas towards politics and community and some of the other things that we, our language, our accent. And so those were things that led me to uh, dig into uh, the research and to, to ultimately go to Scotland, earn a PhD at the University of Glasgow. And uh, since then, I've written several books on the, t on the subject. So Tell me how your passion for looking into this evolved into actually writing the book, Rediscovering the South's Celtic Roots. I think a lot of it stemmed from the fact that I was an illegitimate child and I didn't know my father until I was 14. For the most part, I'd say for the next 30, 40 years of my life was, was a quest to understand where I came from, who I was. And there's something about us as human beings. We want to know who we are, where we came from, what, what makes us different, what makes us special. I think we're all looking for some uniqueness, some special purpose for being here. What is it about the South and Tennessee specifically that made it so attractive to the people with Celtic backgrounds? Imagine a place that looks like this. The same type of uh, seasonal climate, it may get hotter here than it does over there, but the winters are not that much different. A winter here is about like the winters in Northern Ireland or southwestern Scotland. When they came over here, they could carry on life as they knew it. They were 
mostly pastoral people. They wanted to herd and, and have sheep and, and cows and pigs and things of that nature. And so when they came over here, they found a land full of bounty. There were trees, lots of trees, lots of fuel, longer growing seasons, lush landscape, bottom lands were fertile. However, the Scots-Irish uh, tended to settle up in the uplands, not down in the bottom lands, because they had sort of a history of fighting. If you saw the movie uh, Braveheart, uh, there's a, it was a tumultuous area where they were fighting with the English or the Protestants or the Catholics over in Northern Ireland. So there was this constant vigil that they had to conduct to uh, identify the enemy, make sure that they were safe. Strategic locations were very important to the Scots-Irish. So they chose hilltops. That's why we call them hilltoppers and hillbillies. You also talk about in your book furthermore about this idea about rural to rural yes. movement mm -hmm. and also why that is important in preserving culture oh, and beliefs. Very good point. That is so critically important. If people were to move, let's say, like my family did in the 1960s, from East Tennessee to Detroit, and they're gonna send their kids to Detroit public schools, they're gonna learn how to say walk, talk, and on, they're gonna know how to say pole versus pole, and so a lot of changes are going to occur because it's a large urban environment. You have a lot of other ethnic groups there. There's a lot of assimilation taking place, uh, homogenization of, of culture. But in a rural environment where people are moving out, there's no impetus to change the culture that's retaining or being retained there. So as a consequence, people who live in a rural area tend to become more conservative. They tend to retain more of the old world ways. Was there a certain area that they came from? Because people tend to kind of immigrate in groups, right? Mostly the people who came here from Ireland came from Northern Ireland. Ulster would be the nine northern counties of of Ireland. It's an ancient kingdom. There's this romantic notion that the ancestors came across the ocean by themselves, you know, and they, they went out on the frontier like Daniel Boone and slept under trees by themselves. No, it didn't work like that. People tended to move with family units and extended family units. And oftentimes, uh, it was the poorest people uh, during the 17th, uh, 1700s, 1800s who came. It wasn't the wealthy people for the most part. It was the people who you know, we were poor, you know, and they were looking for an opportunity to survive. We see these Celtic influences in Tennessee today and also a lot of the names of our counties, too. In many cases, uh, political jurisdictions, names of towns and stuff took on the names of uh, people that they respected or some aspect, some place in their cultural history that would, uh, that, that would serve them well. What are some other Celtic connections with the county names in Tennessee? Morgan County. Morgan County, Daniel Boone's uh, mother was Sarah Morgan from Wales. And so the name Morgan is a Welsh name. Uh, you've got Campbell County up here in Jacksboro in La Follette. Campbell was such a prominent name in Scotland that the, uh, the family were known as the Lords of Argyll. And Argyll was an old ancient province over in the western part of Scotland. And see, that doesn't scream of having Celtic roots no, to me at all. It no. sounds pretty basic kind of name. You think it's a soup company over in England somewhere, <laughs> but no, 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 it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a Celtic uh, Scottish name, Campo. It sounds like they wanted changes for the, the big reasons, the religious reasons, the freedom reasons, but they still wanted that familiarity. Oh, yeah. They still like to say the words that they, uh, they love to say, like fixin' to and yuns and I reckon. And I got a hankering. You know, and those are all the words that they brought with them. Here's one I say a lot as a mom, scoot. Scoot that chair over here. That is absolutely a word that comes from there. And I never would have imagined that. To me, that's just a very Southern kind yeah, of thing think, to say. Uh, yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But actually, it, it, you can trace it all the way back to Norway. There's words, but then there's also maybe just how you say them, like dialects, like mm -hmm. far. We mix in a little bit of uh, those uh, uh, Northern Irish words with the way they were pronounced, or words were, similar words were pronounced in southwestern England where Daniel Boone's family came from. And like, for example, where Daniel Boone's family came from in the Celtic region of England, and what's the, known as Cor Cornwall, they would have said, yeller dog. Yeller dog, that's a yeller dog. And so that particular population came over here too. And so you had a mingling together of, he was hired yesterday and he was fired today and you blend in a little bit of the accent influence from southwestern England and you get he was far he was hard yesterday and he is far today
we were talking a little bit too about the difference between I'm fixing to and I'm aiming to or mm -hmm. I aim to. I've done this probably for 20 years now, well, not 20 years, but at least 10 years in my geography classes taught here in Appalachia. I will say to, uh, I'll say to students, now for those of you who are from Appalachia, you will really relate to what I'm going to ask. Those of you who aren't from here, learn something. Uh, which is more immediate, fixing to or aiming to? And they'll all say fixing to. What do you hope people take away from your book? Well, I hope they rediscover something, and they, they, as if they ever knew. But you know, they're going to find out that if they're from East Tennessee, they're going to have cultural ways, attitudes, ideas, values that are traceable to some other place. In many respects, it's like a grandmother's quilt, and it's weaved together with love, beauty, and hopefully harmony, and it can be an heirloom to pass on to the next generation. Well, thank you so much. I am fixing to end our conversation, but I've enjoyed it very much. It's Dr. Barry Van, thank you. It's been my pleasure. been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. You bet. Next on Tennessee Life, woodworking is in this musician's blood. We go inside his shop to learn more about making and playing the Irish bouzouki. And later, the cultural experiences of an Irish reporter who got his American television break in Tennessee. Music is certainly a big part of any culture. It's one thing to play those traditional Irish tunes, but one Tennessee musician took his passion a step further. He actually builds one of the instruments. We watch Gil Draper as he crafts and plays the Irish bazooki. It has this very own unique sound, kind of a sparkly, jangly kind of a tone. And it's very, it's just different from the guitar. You know, the bazooki just has a really rich, sparkly tone that I really like. The bazooki is actually a Greek instrument. It's been around in the Greek culture for, for centuries, but the Irish adopted it and pretty much simplified it. The Irish bazooki is definitely its own instrument and it's tuned differently it's used for uh, different music, obviously. Uh, it's for traditional Irish music. So the story goes is a Irish folk singer named Johnny Moynihan came across a Greek bazooki and thought it might work for the Irish tradition. And then he sort of developed it, used it in his band. He was playing in a couple of bands back then. It sort of just evolved with the uh, Irish tradition that way. My name is Gil Draper and I'm a musician and I build traditional Irish bazookis here in my shop in Knoxville. Well, I grew up in Cookville, Tennessee and I've always been interested in woodworking since I was a small child. You know, it's just always been a part of my life. My great-grandfather started Draper Lumber Company in Cookville about the turn of the century of last century and my grandfather ran that uh, the Draper Lumber Company up until uh, the 1980s. I've always been interested in working with wood and I've always wanted to build instruments I just never really thought I could and I got to become good friends with a local mandolin maker named Lynn Dudenbostel he's probably one of the most well-respected mandolin builders in the world. He lives in Maryville. And I had him do some work on a mandolin of mine, and I got to go visit him in his shop and, and see what he does. And, and then I realized that, hey, maybe this is something I could do. I started building instruments in 2010, and I started out building Appalachian dulcimers, and then uh, guitars, and now bazookis. The first thing I do is I get the raw lumber and square it up. From there I will glue it up, you know, into glue the plates together, the, the top and the back together, and then route out the sound hole, uh, make the rosette that goes around the sound hole, and cut the woods to shape on the bandsaw. For the neck, I'll take my rough cut billet and trace out the shape of the neck 
on the billet and cut it out on the bandsaw. And that's pretty much the beginning steps of how to build an instrument. I get the wood from various sources. A lot of it is locally obtained here. I've actually been able to go out and help them cut the trees down and, and buck up the wood and haul it out. So uh, some of the wood that I use, I've actually harvested myself. And even some walnut I've harvested locally here in, in Knoxville that I'll use for necks and backs and sides. You know, I can really say that I've built an instrument from scratch when I'm using wood that I milled up from the tree and made it from the tree to the final instrument. It's, it's quite an experience. I do enjoy the process. Um, I think that's really important to be a, to be a really good uh, musical instrument maker. You have to just naturally and wholeheartedly enjoy the process of building and not necessarily try to think about the finished product so much, but more about the process of building and the enjoyment you get from building. I think it really helps to be a, a better builder, to be a musician and know what good tone is and, and especially a good setup. That's really important for a professional musician, especially to have an instrument that's really well set up really stable and well built and that sounds good and so being a musician I'm able to hear at least what I think sounds good and what I believe other musicians other bazooki players think sound good so it's good to have an ear for for tone really I think helps be a, a better musical instrument maker it takes so long and so much time to build an instrument and you know, when creating something like that from scratch it's really it's a very powerful experience and I have a really deep connection with every instrument that I build. Now for a story of an Irish turned Tennessee television reporter. James Mahan had media experience in Ireland and England, but longed to work in American television. After hundreds of applications, it was Tennessee that welcomed him. He got his break at a Chattanooga station. I talked with Mahan about reporting on events in Tennessee and the new perspective it has given him as a journalist. They say that life is a journey. Tell me about yours from Ireland to Tennessee. That's quite a journey. I suppose looking back, it began, began in 2011. I was finishing undergraduate studies in the west coast of Ireland in a city called Galway, about 65,000 people. It's a seaside, seaside town. And I did a degree in English and classical history, but I had spent so much time messing with radio stations and being in and out of reality TV that I discovered you can actually give a message or share a message so much quicker and more effectively through the medium of broadcasting. And I was still confused about my life, so I jumped on a plane and went to New York. I ended up working in a footlocker in Herald Square and three or four months in the summer of 2011 in New York selling shoes <laughs> to random tourists, um, I discovered that People's, everyone has a story. No matter who you are or where you're from, you have a story. And if I could tell people stories and do that professionally and do that wherever it would take me, then that's what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. Then I ended up coming to Knoxville and coming to Tennessee and that's two and a half years ago and my world has changed since. Were you born in Ireland? I was born in Eastern Europe. I was born in Romania and I was adopted in July of 1990. Um, when I was about, I think it was about a week old. The word trend is kind of strange to use when you're talking about adoption. But there was a trend towards, I suppose, children at that time who were coming out of countries like Romania and Bulgaria and Hungary being adopted by families in Western Europe. It was a very, very tumultuous time for those countries behind the, the Iron Curtain, as it was. Um, you, you become more, I suppose, grateful because so many, so many children didn't get out. 
so many children were adopted from Romania and taken to places like Ireland and taken to the United States and Canada. And I, got, I was just one of the lucky ones. Tell me a little bit more about Ireland, like where you grew up, and uh, tell me more about your family. There's four of us, um, and we're from a very small community of 2,000 people. There was 775 in my high school, and everyone knows everyone. And I think that's why when people talk about coming to somewhere like East Tennessee, the community values that are apparent here, where communities come together in times of need, when you have tornadoes, when you guys have severe weather, you see it or people stand by each other, friends and neighbours and communities come together and that's the kind of world I'm from, where everyone knows everyone. What led you to television? There are so many situations in life where you meet people who have a story and you know if you could get their story out there, they might be able to change or impact someone else's life, whether it's to do with addiction or abuse or a harrowing experience or a positive experience that can give someone hope. If you can take that story and give that person a platform to project their story through a camera lens down into people's little boxes and little phones and computer screens across the widest possible area, you can impact people's lives. Tell me what it was like applying for jobs here in America. I applied to 183 TV stations in 12 states from October to December of 2012. Of 183 TV stations, 170 either never replied or said no. The remainder, I did interviews with, in, with in very strange circumstances, actually. I remember getting a phone call from a news director in, I think it was Bismarck, North Dakota, who was in hospital at the time and tried to do a phone interview with me while he was on medication, um, which was a whole different experience. <laughs> Eventually, CBS, Channel 12, WDEF in Chattanooga gave me that opportunity. And I remember I got the Megabus from Knoxville down to Chattanooga. They were very welcoming. Tell me about your uh, series Through Irish Eyes. Through Irish Eyes came about by accident. There was never an intention. I was going down as a general assignment news reporter. But so many situations would arise where people would be curious as to where I was from or what I was doing, wandering around rural Alabama or Georgia or East Tennessee or North Carolina with the TV camera. And they would ask me about Ireland and then also play little jokes on me and I'd play little jokes on them and tell them leprechauns were real. And sometimes folks would ask me about Harry Potter and I'd tell them that Hogwarts was closed down for inspections and that kind of thing. And we'd all have little humorous moments. And the more I got to spend time in East Tennessee and in this part of the world, I discovered that you have such rich, quirky humour and such diverse culture. You've got so much music and art and sculpture and expression and theatre across the Smoky Mountains. There's so much happening here and there's so much of it that needs to be captured and preserved. And often as an outsider, I can see that. And it started with line dancing and it carried through into rodeos and barbecuing and soapbox derby racing. Have you found events, sports or customs that make you feel a little bit like you're back in Ireland? Bluegrass music because so many of those instruments were brought over by immigrants, so many banjos and fiddles and that kind of thing. It's fascinating just to hear certain bars of musical performances that are traditional to North Carolina and Tennessee that sound very, very familiar to old Irish airs. At times, if you, can clo if you close your eyes, and you, you almost feel you're being transported 4,200 miles that way. Tell me about your first Southern cooked food. My first Southern cooked food was probably with some of the staff from East Tennessee PBS. And I think we went to a place called Chandler's and I had okra, which I still don't know what okra is, but, <laughs> but I had fried okra and macaroni and cheese and, and chicken of some kind. And um, this blue juice that came out of a... I think it was called Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid, that's it, Kool-Aid. It was like a blue sugar juice, and it, I didn't know what it was, and I, I guess we'll never know what Kool-Aid is. I'll, I was on radio in Ireland in, in the UK, and I remember people commenting and messaging me going, what are you eating? <laughs> what is this stuff? It looks good, but we don't know what it is. And I tried to explain to them what okra was, that it's some kind of vegetable that you can fry. It's not quite a Brussels sprout, it's not quite a cabbage or a pea, it's something else. Now that you have been able to experience Tennessee and the US. 
What were your biggest misconceptions about America before you came here? I don't mean to be disrespectful. I don't mean to be rude whatsoever. But I think the projection of Southern people as being, I suppose, hick-like or less, lesser intelligence is a horrible and false projection. There are so many people who are so educated and have such world perspectives. And that has blown me out of the water. And I've been grateful that it's blown me out of the water. I'm glad that there hasn't been that stereotype projected. So you see yourself staying in America and doing the work you love? I think so. You have, on average, per se, four TV stations for even the smallest places. We have four TV stations for the whole country. We have four and a half million people. We have four TV stations. In Knoxville alone, you have four TV stations. We have four and a half million people who only watch those four stations. So there's so much news here. There are so many people here. There's so much good and bad, but there's a lot of good. And if I can keep doing that and keep staying here and keep showing some of that good, not just to the people who are watching in, in our viewing area or whichever viewing area I'm in, but around the world, and that, and that, that's all I want to do. We hope you're enjoying your Tennessee life. I'm Vicki Lawson. See you next time. Tennessee Life is sponsored by Next to New, an upscale consignment shop serving Knoxville. Next to New Knox.com. And by The Flower Pot for over 100 years, offering flowers and same day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations. KnoxvilleFlowerPot.com.